We are the weirdos, mister. We are the weirdos, mister. <sighs> Is nothing sacred? Hi everyone, it's Lady Genevieve. The Craft is a film I've had on my maybe I should make a video about this list since 2018, which was also the same year I first started creating more in-depth reviews and video essays about films and television series. I love The Craft. It is a top tier teen film. And when I say teen film, I mean that all of the main characters are teenagers in high school. I don't practice witchcraft myself, but I do enjoy my fair share of witch stories in fiction. Now Blumhouse is doing a sequel to The Craft and the trailer does not look good. I'm not saying that the film will be bad because a great film can have a bad trailer, Jennifer's body, and great films are made by artists while bad trailers are made by people who work in marketing. I will reserve my complete judgment on The Craft Legacy until I can see the entire film, but what I will say for the time being is that Recycling a quirky line of dialogue to try to play on nostalgia in the trailer feels a lot more like insulting the intelligence of the people who have a long-standing appreciation for the original film. Additionally, you have your new protagonist looking at an image of Nancy, who is a character from the original film, but the image that's been used is a freeze frame from the film that is from the perspective of the original new girl, Sarah, when she is looking at Nancy. It was never a photograph that existed in the canon of the first film. If you wanted to have an Easter egg photograph of Nancy, you could have used an actual photo of her from the 90s, preferably when the craft was being filmed. You can't tell me there aren't some old photos floating around, maybe in a box in someone's closet or in the archives, presuming that you had a photographer working on set. You probably took promotional photos for the film at one point or another, with the actors in full costume, hair, and makeup. You can't do a half-baked attempt at referencing the original to try to appeal to people who love the original if you're not going to go about it in a way that indicates a deep understanding of why people love the original film. The Craft is a film that has the ability to keep its original audience as well as build a new one because it's incredibly mature and thoughtful about the serious and heavy issues it addresses in the story. You never outgrow it because the subject matter holds up as teen viewers grow into adults. Not all fiction that you consume as a child or adolescent grows with you as you evolve and hopefully mature. Today we're going to revisit the craft and talk a bit about why it is still a relevant film over 20 years after it was first released. The Craft debuted back in 1996 and achieved a respectable box office run, particularly since it was made on a modest $15 million budget. However, the film's cult following, no pun intended, picked up far more traction when the film exploded in video sales. The creative team behind The Craft had always intended for the film to be more of a PG-13 release by avoiding things like nudity or the F-word. This was a story they wanted to be seen by teenage girls, but the MPAA insisted on giving it an R rating. Director Andrew Fleming said, Right before shooting, the MPAA notified us, because I guess we'd sent the script to them, that no matter what we did, the movie would be an R rating. They said it was black magic and teenagers. And I said, hold on, paganism and Wicca and witchcraft are not black magic. Black magic is devil worship. We had made that distinction very clear and early that it's not about devil worship. They wouldn't budge, so it was frustrating. If I had to guess, they wouldn't do that now. The Craft was conceived by screenwriter Peter Filardi and producer Doug Wick, who was interested in telling a story about female empowerment and was aware that witchcraft is a great vehicle for stories about the empowerment and agency of women. He wanted to tell a story that would be about very real teenage emotions expressed through witchcraft. At that time, Filardi was already immersed in the world of teen Satanism and knew a lot about how magic worked and where it came from. Filardi said about the project, I remember telling him that magic is historically a weapon of the underclass. It was originally practiced by people of the Heath, 
or heathens, poor people without the power of a king, army, or church behind them. Our characters could not be popular, beautiful overlords of their school. For real magic to work, they would have to be outsiders with more than desires. Real magic requires need. This creative inception for the project puts a lot into perspective, including the fact that the four lead characters are indeed all outsiders in their school's social ecosystem, but even the detail of the school itself having its own religious element to it, as we see a brief scene of the students going to mass on campus. Filardi conducted extensive research into earth magic, and the film also hired Pat Devon as a technical consultant to help with things like writing the chants and incantations used in the film. Director Andrew Fleming wanted Wiccans to be able to see the film and not be offended by any of the magical aspects in the story. As commendable as these efforts are to be respectful, the film's four leads and their stories are the driving force behind the film's lasting appeal, as this is a highly character-driven film. Hail to the guardians of the Watchtowers of the South, powers of fire and feeling. Hear us! Bonnie's character arc is born of fire and centered in transformation. Her journey begins as a meek but kind girl. Okay. Now you, you can sit here. Her reserved demeanor comes from her self-consciousness about the burn scars on her back. Adolescence is often the peak of feeling insecure about your body and your appearance in general. The craft compounds that adolescent turmoil with a traumatic accident leaving significant scarring. Bonnie undergoes a painful experimental treatment to try to improve the appearance of her scarring, and as this coven begins to use more magic, her one wish is for Manon to take away her scars. I'll take my scars. Take my scars. A sharp needle and a bit of magic, and her scars are gone. But her physical transformation leads to a transformation of her personality as well. There's a newfound attention from boys. Shit. Hey, buddy. Uh, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, how's it going, Bonnie? And that extra validation serves to boost her newfound confidence even further. All of the girls are emboldened by what the magic brings them, but the magic they use has a karmic quality where whatever you put out, you get back times three which leads to unforeseen consequences. In Bonnie's case, she is tormented with a vision of her scars, returning to disfigure her even more than her original state, and she loses her magic. Bonnie's story is relatable to the originally intended teen audience for its focus on struggles with body image, but it has far more dimension and intensity because of the scars and because of the magic. Her story is not about shaming women for wanting to be beautiful or punishing women for indulging in vanity. It's a cautionary tale about becoming so swept up in vanity that you become disconnected from the other admirable qualities of your character. Bonnie, what's going on with you? You used to be nice. Now you're completely narcissistic. Okay. Now you, you can sit here. Excuse me, but I spent a big chunk of my life being a monster, and now that I'm not, I'm having a good time. I'm sorry that bothers you. Bonnie could have accepted the gift of being healed of her injuries and proceeded to live a more fulfilled life, but instead spiraled into being narcissistic and downright cruel by following along with Nancy's tormenting of Sarah, but she wasn't alone in following her. Hail to the guardians of the watchtowers of the West, powers of water and intuition, hear us! Rochelle is a character that was rewritten from originally being a white girl struggling with bulimia to a black girl struggling with experiencing racism after Rachel True was cast to play her. I deliberately kept Bonnie's section short when writing this video because there is so much information to cover about Rochelle, not only in the material for her as a character, but all the other moving parts to do with the actress and the production, release, and legacy of the craft. In the 90s and even even now, over 20 years later, it's incredibly rare to see a black lead in a mainstream teen film. 
This isn't only about the amount of screen time, or whether the actor is given a fully developed character and story to play, not a token, not a best friend or sidekick, but a co-lead with the rest of the leads. Oftentimes stories that do have black leads with that quality of material are not showcased or pushed in the same way, as executives will often treat that art as niche, and something that will only appeal to a black audience, which is of course course, racist. Make no mistake, Rochelle's story is great, and I will delve into it in a bit, but first we need to talk about what went on for her during the making of, release, and aftermath of the film's release. Rachel said this about a scene of hers that was cut. When we did the read-through, I had a scene with my upper-middle-class stodgy parents. We shot it, but it ended up being cut from the film, which I was a little bummed about because I was like, wait, all the other girls get parents? I don't get parents? And this was 20 years ago, so then I said, listen, you're black and you're in the movie, that's pretty good already. If Rochelle won't say it, I will. It wasn't acceptable then, and it's not acceptable now. How many seasons of Stranger Things are we all going to be subjected to, and we still haven't seen Lucas's parents? What's good, Hollywood? Are you insinuating that these children don't have parents in their lives? Are you ever going to let go of these old-timey microaggressions? True also had this to say about the publicity tour for the film. There was a publicity junket that they were only going to take the other three girls to. At the time, 20 years ago, I was like, oh, it's me. It's me. It must be me. And now I realize it wasn't me. It was marketing. They didn't really think it was going to get a black audience, is my guess. That would never happen today. If you have four leads in a movie, you will take all four leads. But that's something that people don't quite understand. It's like, why do black people still whinge on about that? Well, because that stuck with me all these years. That for some reason, I wasn't as important. Now, I did eventually get added to that junket because one of the other actresses said, you should really bring her. Then, the next year, Faruza, Robin, and Nev were all on the MTV Movie Awards, and I was not. Granted, those girls had all worked more than me. At the time, I just said, oh, it's probably because Faruza's known and Nev is on a TV show. I'm kind of 50-50 on it. It's also that they were white. Then, finally, the piece de resistance of it all. I have to share this quote, too, because I don't trust that all of you are going to go and read this article about the film, even though I have it linked in the description box with my other citations. I have a love-hate thing with Charmed because that's clearly a craft ripoff. They used the same song and the same font. Also, leave it to Aaron Spelling to make them all sisters so they didn't even have to have an ethnic character. Listen, several points were made, and that's coming from someone who used to love watching Charmed episodes almost daily because they were constantly playing in syndication alongside the likes of shows like Angel or Smallville. The craft is so clearly the superior work of art in regards to both story and the characters. Now is when we can jump into Rochelle's story in the film, because despite the cut scene, it's still compelling. Rochelle struggles with being bullied by the high school mean girl, and that's putting it lightly, Laura. Laura is not a shallow archetype. The things she says about and to Rochelle are truly vile, and perhaps worst of all is that she cannot be reasoned with. It makes no difference if Rochelle is polite to her. Laura is just a vicious racist. Being on the receiving end of racism is not something to be taken lightly, particularly when it happens at a crucial stage of your development. It's far more insidious than just your feelings getting hurt. According to an article by the Academy of Pediatrics on the impact of racism on child and adolescent health, the impact of racism has been linked to birth disparities and mental health problems in children and adolescents. The biological mechanism that emerges from chronic stress leads to increased and prolonged levels of exposure to stress hormones and oxidative stress at the cellular level. Prolonged exposure to stress hormones, such as cortisol, leads to inflammatory reactions that predispose 
predispose individuals to chronic disease. In a paper by Williams and Williams Morris, it was reported that some studies have noted that experiencing racism was positively related to things like cardiovascular and psychological reactivity, elevated blood pressure, elevated levels of psychological distress, lower levels of life satisfaction and happiness, and poorer physical health. Rochelle's distress over this cruel treatment is evident. She also appears to have aspirations related to being on the swim team or maybe the diving team. Were she to excel in this field, perhaps she could go on to compete or get an athletic scholarship at a decent university. That's all speculation, of course, but the transformation is notable between the first time she tries to do a dive in the film and flops because of Laura's targeted harassment. And the second time when Laura is too distracted by her hair falling out to do anything to interfere with Rochelle's dive. Even the coach takes notice of the execution of her dive with an underlying implication that he hasn't noticed her talent before this. Removing the source of the racially motivated bullying allows her to thrive in her extracurricular activity. Oh god, look, there is a pubic hair in my brush. Oh no, wait, wait. That's just one of Rochelle's little nappy hairs. When Rochelle has an opportunity to use a more powerful magic, she decides to get revenge on Laura by cursing her hair. It's difficult to fully explain how significant this plot point is. Crystal Powell's article in the Brigham Young University Law Review explains in great detail the origins and history surrounding the discrimination towards black hair. The stigmatization against black hair in American culture dates back to slavery when white slave owners sought to pathologize African females features like their skin and hair to further demoralize the slaves, especially the women. In contemporary settings, we continue to see a pervasive tendency for non-black individuals to associate negative racial stereotypes against black people and black hair. Arbitrary grooming policies have been implemented at various schools or companies that disproportionately target black hairstyles with the most extreme conflicts resulting in punishment against black students with things like suspension or expulsion and the termination of black employees, and all of this is over their hair. Some of these discriminatory practices have made it all the way to trials, like the prominent case of Rogers versus American Airlines, in which the court ruled that the airline was legally permitted to have grooming policies that were discriminatory to black hair, as they had a policy forbidding their employees from wearing all braided hairstyles. When it comes to these types of cases, the courts have frequently disagreed with Title VII and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission guidelines on workplace grooming policies. The federal courts overwhelmingly tend to deny that black women have a claim for racial discrimination when they have been terminated or lost out on a job opportunity because of wearing their hair in a hairstyle suitable to their natural texture. Given how much this area of discrimination continues to remain unaddressed and unresolved, it's all the more impressive that a film like The Craft, intended to reach teen girls, would incorporate the targeting of black hair into the story. It's not just mentioned in passing, it's what jumpstarts Rochelle's revenge magic. She's bullying the bully, but things start to escalate far more than Rochelle first intended. What did I do? By the time we see Laura for the last time, her spirit is now broken under a bad wig. But despite Rochelle's participation later on with Nancy's attacks against Sarah, the film still makes a point of showing you her conflicted emotions about the escalation of her revenge spell. Laura never harbored any empathy or compassion for Rochelle, but Rochelle is a better person than her. There's a lot of nuance to Rochelle's inner conflict and how the audience can interpret it. Is she wrong, ethically speaking, for wanting revenge on a racist? Not necessarily, but what she learns is that achieving that revenge, and to that degree, doesn't bring her the satisfaction that she thought it would. Hail to the guardians of the watchtowers of the east, the powers of air and invention.
to many who watch the craft, Nancy is the villain of the story. She's a tornado of id and a force unchained by the magic she gains. This assessment isn't wrong per se, but it is lacking a deeper understanding of the other pressures that shape her identity and drive her actions. At the beginning, she is introduced as living in a trailer with her mother and her mother's abusive boyfriend. When I was researching academic resources to strengthen my points about the harmful effects of racism on young people, I came across an excerpt that also fit well to Nancy as a character. Young adults who were bystanders to racism and other forms of victimization as youth experience profound physiological and psychological effects when asked to recall the memory of a past anchoring event as a victim or bystander that are comparable to those experienced by first responders after a major disaster. The lack of stability in Nancy's home life is a driving force behind her social problems. So what does she do? She acts out. She falls for the wrong boy who is only interested in using women for his own pleasure and status with no regard for them beyond that. I think she doesn't want to be white trash anymore or something. And I told her, like, you're white, honey, just deal with it. Nancy feels powerless, which makes witchcraft all the more appealing to her. When the spell starts to work in her favor, she is able to cut down the abusive figure in her home, get a financial boost to raise her and her mother into a higher class of wealth and status. While the other girls have more specific desires they hone in on during this ritual, Nancy wants to fundamentally shift from feeling powerless to being powerful. You must invoke the spirit. But it made Nancy crazy. She takes it to a dark place. The type of long-term pain and trauma that Nancy has been subjected to at such a young age does not have a quick fix. A cash payout, a new apartment, and a few dead toxic men will not be enough to heal the deep wounds she has. Rochelle enacts revenge on her bully just like Nancy gets revenge on the men that have harmed her, but in Nancy's case, she does not feel any guilt for her actions. You don't even exist to me! Trauma does not manifest the same way in people, and in Nancy's case, her aggression and propensity for violence escalates the more power she gains. A lot of her actions demonstrate how some people who are abused go on to abuse others. There is another dimension to Nancy's role in the larger story, but in order to understand it, we need to talk about Sarah. Hail to the guardians of the watchtowers of the north by the powers of Mother and Earth. Hear us. Sarah's story is, for the most part, about struggling with your mental health. She grew up with just her father, and it's eventually revealed that her mother died when giving birth to her. Losing a parent in your childhood can be highly traumatic on its own, but the circumstances of Sarah's mother's death further compounds the guilt she has. When she moves and attends a new school, she is the new girl without a core group of friends. So what is she drawn to? The other outsiders. And what do they engage in? Juvenile delinquent behavior, like shoplifting. Sarah does resist crossing certain lines, but she's still looking for a place to belong. Her story also collides with the issues of toxic masculinity and rape culture when she meets Chris, a superficially charming popular boy at school. He hits on her, and the first time they hang out, they seem to get along really well. But when he tries to push towards physical intimacy, she stops him. Whether it's because she isn't ready to do that with him, or anyone for that matter, is not explained, but ultimately it doesn't matter. No means no. Are you mad? No. He goes on to spread lies about her at school, claiming that they were physically intimate. Chris subscribes to a toxic mentality and pattern of behavior of pretending to be nice to get close to girls and coerce them into being physically intimate and discarding them regardless of whether or not they did get physical with one another. He is a misogynist who insults and degrades these girls he gets involved with to boost his own reputation among his close male peers. Despite being treated horribly by Chris, Sarah uses the group's spell to focus on him. Did you tell your friends? What? You're lying sack of shit. No, but I will. This shift in his behavior seems nice at first, as he apologizes for lying about her and promises to tell the truth. All is not as it seems with this love spell. 
His romantic interest in her is seemingly rejuvenated, but it doesn't take long for things to take a darker turn. His behavior becomes more obsessive, and he still doesn't respect her boundaries. In another story, this type of toxic behavior would be treated as something romantic. There are too many examples to name, or properly delve into, of teen romances, romantic comedies, or romantic dramas that have romanticized toxic, horrific behavior. But The Craft leaves no room for misunderstanding that Chris's lack of respect for boundaries and his entitlement to women is just as present now as it was before the girls cast their spell. He attempts to assault her, but thankfully she gets away. The subtext of this entire arc between Sarah and Chris is a cautionary tale. If your romantic interest reveals themselves to be toxic, abusive, or misogynistic, understand that this is who they are. Don't stick around, don't try to appeal to the good nature you want them to have. Just get out. The only way you know how to treat women is by treating them like whores when you're the whore! And that's gonna stop! In rewatching this film as an adult, I've come to appreciate an entirely new dimension to the relationship between Sarah and Nancy. I've already discussed Nancy's material in her own right, but when you shift the perspective back to Sarah being the protagonist of the story, once we get into the third act, when Nancy has been corrupted by her power, her role in the story changes somewhat. Instead of the focus being on her own emotional pain or traumatic origins, we start to observe her as the personification of Sarah's mental illness. She is that harmful inner voice that pushes you towards self-destruction. She's inside my dreams. She knows what's going on inside my head. She can read my mind. If I was as pathetic as you are, I would have killed myself ages ago. You should get on with it. Sarah's mental health struggles are made known to the audience and the group right from the start. Her scars from a previous attempt to take her life are shown and discussed. She also shares how she has struggled with hallucinations. I used to hallucinate things and then I'd open them and they'd still be there. They wouldn't go away. When these girls turn on her, they choose to induce hallucinations in her through magic. They are trying to reinvigorate the guilt she has struggled with her entire life about the death of her mother. They want her to take her own life. The peak of Sarah's story can work on a number of levels. Viewers who want to see witches battle with powers can watch the heroine learn to control and unlock her magic like never before. The heroine also finds the strength to stand up against bullies and remove herself from a toxic friend group. But in regards to the mental health dimension of her story, Sarah binding Nancy can be interpreted as her finally learning how to get a better handle on her mental health, with things like better coping mechanisms and external support to help guide her. I bind you, Nancy, from doing harm. Harm against other people and harm against yourself. The language in this spell is essential to understanding how Sarah's story and her final battle with Nancy is ultimately about her mental illness. Nancy represents that voice in a person's head that is telling them to end it all. Sarah says that she is binding Nancy to not harm others or to harm herself. Sarah is taking back control of an unstable situation. The outcome of this confrontation is not for Sarah to use her powers to kill Nancy. The last we see of Nancy is her shouting while restrained in a psychiatric facility. It's symbolic of the fact that mental health struggles don't just magically go away. You can't destroy them, but you can put the work in to better manage them so they don't take over and control you to the point of you doing something you cannot come back from. I didn't fully understand or appreciate this particular dimension of the end of this film until I got older and started studying psychology, but it's very clear to me now that Sarah's journey to better manage her mental health is a far more compelling and interesting storyline than it usually gets credit for. The Craft is, in my humble opinion, incredibly underrated in the discourse of teen films. Some teen films age like wine, and others do not. John Hughes' teen films, for example, age like milk. And perhaps a more controversial teen film opinion that I will say with zero hesitation is that Mean Girls is an incredibly overrated teen film. Now don't misunderstand me, I don't think it's a bad film, but when you gather a larger pool of teen films, 
films across a broader time span, it simply does not have the material to compete. Many of its iconic moments and imagery have already been done in plenty of other better teen films. New Girl joins a friendship trio of girls and gets more than she bargained for. The Craft did that. Jawbreaker sort of did that, though Fran was not a new girl to the school, but she did undergo a transformation in her character the longer she spent in this new social group. New Kid gets introduced to the various eccentric cliques of the school. 10 Things I Hate About You did that, but was not as racially insensitive while doing so, even though it came out five years earlier than Mean Girls. Squad of girls walking together in slow motion, The Craft did that. Does it need to be happening in a hallway in that case? Jawbreaker also did that, but with far better fashion than anything you see at any point in Mean Girls. But when you really dig deep into the essence of Mean Girls, it's just not saying anything of note in comparison to a film like The Craft. The Craft intelligently addresses mental health, body image, domestic violence and poverty, racism and bullying in general, misogyny and sexual assault, and does not handle these issues with kitty gloves or try to water them down in order to appeal to children. Mean Girls tells the audience that if you act like the girls that are mean to you, that you yourself are a mean girl. Wow so profound. Pardon the tangent, but I've been thinking about this quite a bit lately, particularly since October 3rd passed somewhat recently, and I was bombarded with a lot of Mean Girls content on my various social media pages, and it got me thinking about how lukewarm and mid-tier of a film Mean Girls is once you are no longer a teen. I don't really know if I care enough about that topic though to prioritize it for its own video, so I figured that for the time being I might as well include some of those talking points into this video. If you have not rewatched The Craft recently, I highly recommend that you go back and do so, or Jawbreaker for that matter, because that film is a vibe, and Vicky Barrett's costumes? A cultural reset. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share this video to help a small content creator out. I recently hit 5k subscribers. I'm very grateful to everyone that has decided that my content is interesting enough to subscribe to. You can also follow me on social media, including Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and Vero. See you in the next one. Bye.